Hello, my name is Garrett Sonier and I'm a doctoral student in the marketing area at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. I have with me today Professor Dominic Hansens, who is the Bud Knapp Professor of Marketing at the UCLA Anderson School. Mike, you discussed the evolution of the marketing discipline to one of formal scientific inquiry, yet for many people the terms marketing and science don't necessarily fit together. How has marketing made use of formal scientific inquiry? Uh, marketing is a business discipline and business disciplines are not necessarily scientific. There may be a lot of discipline in it, but it's not necessarily scientific rigor. But what has changed in the world of marketing, much like a uh, similar uh, change took place in the world of finance and the world of production management, is that the data sources that today's marketers have access to uh, are so much better than they used to be uh, in, in the past. And, and I'm thinking about uh, scanner panel data, I'm thinking about um, internet data, and a variety of other information sources that allow marketers uh, and marketing scholars like, like myself and, and like yourself uh, to really probe into some deep questions about, for example, what generates market share, why is one company more successful than others, how do customers make choices among competing brands, what is the effect of a, of a competitive uh, price cut, let's say, and so forth. And because of the wealth of data, as well as the fact that uh, a, for, a, for, a formal scientific discipline exists, we are now at a point where we can really talk about marketing science, even though it is still growing and, in fact, in its infancy. Upon which specific disciplines does marketing draw for knowledge? And does marketing have its own set of theories and empirical generalizations? It has uh, traditionally drawn mostly upon economics uh, and statistics and psychology. And the reasons for that are actually quite interesting, and it's also what makes marketing, for me at least, such an interesting discipline. Uh, the economic foundations help us understand how managers should allocate scarce resources. You know, for example, their budgets are scarce, they're not unlimited, they need to make choices that are sometimes very difficult. The, <coughs> excuse me, the statistics, and in particular the econometrics, helps us understand how the various variables that are of interest uh, relate to each other. So, for example, if you were to increase your advertising budget, what is likely to happen to your revenue? That is a question that we can answer from statistical analysis. And finally, the psychology helps us uh, deep, more deeply into the mind and the heart of consumers to understand at an intuitive and at a qualitative level uh, what it is that actually makes them, for example, prefer brand A over brand B. So marketing uh, dwells primarily on economics, uh, statistics, and psychology. And does marketing have its own set of theories and empirical generalizations? Uh, it most certainly does. Uh, theory, of course, is a big word, and certainly by some scientific criteria, we probably don't have a formal marketing theory, and I doubt that we even need one. But um, certainly a lot of empirical generalizations exist precisely because these data sources are so good these days, and a number of scholars and uh, firms and uh, doctoral students and so forth around the world have published important papers on what tends to be found in the data when you care to look deeply. Some decision makers in firms claim that marketing research often gets the wrong answer. Uh, a famous example is New Coke. Some of your work cites some fairly alarming statistics. For example, 80% of new products fail, 85% of sales promotions are unprofitable, 50% of advertising is ineffective. Does marketing, needs, does marketing need to increase its understanding of these areas, or is the problem in the dissemination of what we know? I think it's a little bit both. Um, first of all, the statistics you, you cite are correct, and they, they suggest that in practice we have a lot of work to do. We really do need to make better decisions uh, in the areas that you just mentioned than in other areas of marketing. So in other words, the bar is higher. Uh, th than it used to be. Uh, but it also points to some good news uh, because even though, for example, half of the advertising does not work, uh, the other half does work. And so if we can, through our understanding, if we can tilt that scale towards perhaps three quarters that works and only a quarter that's wasted, you should see uh, so tremendous returns in, in society as a whole uh, as, as a result of that. 
Uh, so there's, there's some, some good news as well. As far as the dissemination goes, I think that is a key aspect, and I'm, I'm glad you touch upon it, because just because faculty and others uh, publish important papers and perhaps you know, scientifically correct papers doesn't mean that everybody learns about that overnight. And there is a bit of a cycle time before the ideas and the findings that are uh, obtained in the laboratory, so to speak, and in our universities and in some of the major consulting firms uh, before these findings actually find them their way into the boardroom and into the day-to-day -day practice of, uh, of executives. The marketing area considers the notion of brand equity from a variety of angles. For example, brand equity could be considered the, the value of the brand to the firm, or it may be considered the value of the brand to the customer. What do you mean when you use the term brand equity? Brand equity is a frequently used word these days. It is sometimes used as a substitute for marketing altogether. Uh, and you are right, there are various definitions of it, and so it's perhaps good to, to sort them out a little bit. Uh, certainly from a psychological perspective, we uh, think mostly of brand equity from a perspective of awareness and association. So, for example, most of us have heard of the automobile brand Volvo, and many of us make an association with safety. Uh, for either the right or the wrong reasons, but that association may exist in consumers' minds, and in that sense, that particular brand has, has a certain equity. And much of the marketing campaigns these days is aimed at trying to improve that brand equity, but the problem is, of course, it is relatively difficult to measure, uh, and it is even more difficult to measure in financial terms. In other words, it's fine for Volvo to have a reputation uh, and a certain awareness as, as a safe car, but does it sell more cars because of that perception? And we've had some recent work in that area, and a number of people have done some, some very good work in that, showing, for example, that if you look at how strong brands either sell more product or are able to achieve a higher price and achieve what we call a revenue premium, and as you know, revenue comes either from volume or from price or from both, that we can, it's been shown scientifically that, high, that branded products tend to have a higher revenue, tend to have a positive revenue premium. In other words, they do better uh, than others. But what we don't yet know, or at least not sufficiently know for, for my taste, is whether or not the investments that go along with creating that premium uh, are worth the money. In other words, even though the result is positive, one should always ask, well, how much money did it take to get there? And from an investor perspective, is it indeed uh, valuable uh, to brand your products in such a way that you generate higher returns for your shareholders? That is an ongoing question that uh, seems to have an answer that can go one way or the other depending on the industry and depending on the nature of competitors. What do you think gives rise to differences in brand equity both across firms and over time? In my judgment, brand equity is the sum of what you've done in the past so long as what you've done in the past is known. So let me get into this. Let us say that you systematically produce good product in your industry. And knowledge is out there either because your customers have indeed tried the product and so they know it's good, but also because either they spread the word or you help that through some advertising and other PR and such activities in such a way that you now have a stock out there, you have a reputation, you, uh, have a, you inspire confidence, which helps you sell more product precisely because you project this confidence uh, in the mind of the consumer. Okay? That to me is, is, uh, are the key sets of drivers to brand equity that you perform very well at the level that matters to customers and that you tell people about it. Because you can perform very well, but not tell anybody, and your equity may be down because nobody's ever heard of you, even though you are, in fact, a very high quality provider. Conversely, you can advertise a lot, have, let's say, average quality product, and not get the brand equity that you would like because the customer satisfaction isn't there to generate that future confidence in your products. So there's two components to it, both of which are terribly important. Nice. Related to the notion of brand equity is the idea of customer equity. What exactly is customer equity and how is it related to brand equity? 
Yes, customer equity is a relatively new concept because even though it is easily understood, I'll explain it in a second, it hasn't become really relevant until the information age kicked in uh, over the past five or ten years or so. Uh, what it is, is the sum of the future income streams, properly discounted, that you may expect from your customer base. So, for example, if you have a customer, if you are, let's say, a barber shop, and you produce very good haircuts at a very reasonable price and a pleasant environment in such a way that your customers keep on coming back, then your customer equity may be high even though your day-to-day -day sales may not be so high because the customer base is so loyal to your enterprise that they generate a future income stream which of course produces high financial value uh, in, in the long run. Th that gets to the notion of, of customer equity. So it is a very financial metric. It is uh, very much uh, future uh, discounted cash flows resulting from your customer base. Now, um, you can achieve high customer equity uh, with or without brands. There are plenty of firms out there that are completely unknown, have no brand equity, and yet have a loyal set of customers that keep on coming back and have very low marketing costs. And that is one way to be very profitable. You can also have somewhat lower customer equity because perhaps the service you provide is okay, but it's not great, but you have worked really hard on distribution, for example, franchising, in such a way that you have a reputation for availability around the country or even around the world and you get your customer equity that way. Okay? So there's various ways to obtain customer equity with or without branding and in fact the link between brand equity and customer equity at this point is not very well understood and it's certainly one area uh, where some research needs to be done and in fact is being done. It sounds like customer equity is a, is a really hard financial measure as you say. Uh, does it take into account more intangible items such as the advocacy or word of mouth created by, by customers? Uh, yes, it does. In fact, in, in some recent work and some ongoing work uh, that I have, I very much try to quantify that intangible asset that you're referring to, uh, which is, for the most part, positive word of mouth. So, for example, if I have a good experience in a restaurant and I tell five people about it, and if pe these people trust my opinion and they go visit the restaurant. So now that restaurant enjoys a revenue stream which is five times the revenue stream just for me, even though perhaps they only had to target some marketing efforts to me. So that word of mouth effect can in fact vastly increase the customer equity on condition that the word of mouth of course is positive and that's a, bi a very big condition. Therefore, we would expect that customer equity will be highly related to customer satisfaction because presumably you would only generate positive word of mouth on those products and services from which you have you derive very high satisfaction levels and therefore an important part of marketing and in fact often neglected is to see to it that your existing customer base is highly satisfied because not only does that maintain the revenue stream through higher retention, but it also fuels the word of mouth, which in a way gives you a free form of advertising because you don't have to pay for a satisfied customer to say good things about you. And the strategic assets value of that in the long run is not to be underestimated. Related to the idea of customer equity is the notion of customer relationship management. And firms seem to be sharpening their focus on customer relationship management. A justification for this focus is that it's cheaper for firms to retain customers than to acquire new ones. What does marketing know about the relative cost of acquisition and retention? Okay, we know a fair amount about acquisition and retention costs. And the overall average is that it takes approximately somewhere between eight and ten times as much to acquire a new customer than it costs to maintain an existing customer. So acquiring new customers is far more expensive than retaining uh, existing ones. Uh, and right there points to the importance of, of good customer sat satisfaction programs. What we know less about is about precisely the factors that create higher retention, other than a general statement that satisfied customers uh, stay with you longer. We do not yet sufficiently know to what extent price management needs to be uh, altered over time, as, as you suggested, that your existing customers need to be given a price break. 
Uh, there are others who say, no, your existing customers should be paying the regular price because they already know what to expect and therefore uh, they have very little risk in consuming your product. However, a new customer runs a risk of not knowing you and therefore making a bad purchase. That's the customer you need to subsidize. So these questions about whether you subsidize existing versus new customers, uh, again, are subject to ongoing research, but is not yet to the point where we have some, some uh, definitive answers.